lights go down. That must mean something magical is about to happen. Wow. Welcome. Thank you all for your patience with the, with the late start. We wanted to make sure everyone that wanted to be here was able to get in, so thank you. Um, my name is Jason Hedden. I'm, oh great, you reminded me of my first note. So we don't want to take any flash photography uh, from the audience. I actually have a photographer who's taken photos of the event, and there are actually robotic cameras hidden in the walls of the theater. That sounds not true, but it really is. And we're recording this. In fact, it's being live streamed right now on local channel five or six or gcsctv.com. So if grandma's home, you can text her real quick and say you can watch it uh, online or on TV. It'll also be available on YouTube afterwards. As I was saying, my name is Jason Hedden. I'm the head of visual and performing arts here. And I'm pleased to welcome you to the Amelia Center Theater. Do we have any first timers here? Anyone for the first time? Do it with a round of applause. Well, welcome. I'm glad you're here. This is our first ever Career in the Arts workshop day, and I'm, I'm pretty thrilled because middle school and high school was the time when I got into the arts. I had a middle school drama teacher who took all the wannabe class clowns. Notice I said wannabe class clowns, not class clowns, and put them in this class together called Drama, and we spent a couple years doing old Saturday Night Live sketches. You know, the good stuff from the 70s. Um, so it was an event like this that sort of sparked my interest in the arts. I have a couple people I want to thank before we get going. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Bay Arts Alliance and Jennifer Jones. They've been extremely gracious in helping us do this event, responsible for helping us get Matthew Holtzclaw here today. Our partners at the Florida Alliance for Arts Education and the Florida Department of Education. Our friends at Commodore Productions, who are hidden in a little closet across the way, filming this event and live streaming it. The Gulf Coast State College Foundation, who also made it possible. All of our artists and teachers that you're going to work today are all volunteering their time because they have a passion about sharing what it is they do for a living with people that are thinking, hey, maybe I would like to explore a career in the arts. You'll notice there's a set on stage right now. Our production of One Man, Two Governors has two more performances, tonight at 7.30 and tomorrow at 2.30. If you'd like to see that show for free, before you leave today, find me and I will put your name on a list so you can come with your family uh, to come back and see the show tonight or tomorrow. It's a hilarious comedy, you don't want to miss it. All right, um, let me switch over and find my bio for Mr. Holtzclaw. I'm really thrilled that Matt was able to be here. Has anyone seen Matthew Holtzclaw before, perform previously? Hey, thanks, one guy, okay. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> It's good, it's a new crowd. Uh, I've known Matt for a long time. He's a graduate of Gulf Coast State College and Bay High School as well, and Florida State and Tallahassee. And uh, he's made a career off of his passion, and he's gonna share some of that with you. M Matthew Holtzkall is one of New York City's most in-demand entertainers and consultants. Matthew Holtzclaw has been recognized as one of the top performers and technicians in the world of magic and special effects. Matthew frequently acts as a magic designer for stage, film, and television productions, and was recently featured on the CW show, a Penn and Teller show called Fool Us. Maybe you saw his performance online. A regular corporate entertainer, but also a member of New York City's variety art scene, he splits his time between the polite and the provocative. Matt, we're going to do polite. Are we doing polite or pro provocative today, Matt? I guess we'll, we'll err on the side of polite. Matthew's written and produced the plays Redhead and Cane's Bayou, and his first screenplay has been made into a feature film, Women and Sometimes Men, that will be making the festival circuit this fall. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage Mr. Matthew Holtzclaw. How y'all doing? Good morning. Uh, so, I am Matthew Holtzclaw, and I'm a professional magician. That means people actually pay me money to do magic tricks. And I thought, while you're still watching and I've not bored you to death with my speech, I thought I'd show you a magic trick now, while you can still focus. To do magic is difficult because it does require so much energy from the audience to take it all in, but I do need you to see this. I need you to hear this. It's very important that you hear this part. Hear that? 
Am I getting into the microphone? We'll do it again. Yeah? Now the thing is, I love this trick. It's one of the first I ever worked on. The reason I love it is that everyone knows the ending. <laughs> right? So if you haven't seen those things get torn, this makes no sense when this happens, right? <laughs> Yeah, right? Thanks. <laughs> Nearly had a stroke in the front row. That's good. That's right. <laughs> That's good. So, folks, um, I have some things I'm going to say to you. Um, I assume if you're here today, it's because you like making things. You like to take things apart and put them back together. Like that newspaper trick, right? See what I did there? Huh? <laughs> uh, that's what art is, taking things apart and putting them back together in a new way, making the commonplace extraordinary, taking something cheap and making it priceless. Uh, you might like to write, draw, paint, sing, dance, design, or make music, or some combination of those, or maybe only just one of those things. And you have either a strong, passionate feeling, or you are hearing that tiny buzzing noise in the back of your head that you could maybe one day enjoy a career in the arts. I felt from a very young age that I wanted to be an artist of some kind. I loved magic, movies, horror novels, stand-up comedy, and special effects. I loved to draw and paint. I adored George Carlin, Penn & Teller, Mad Magazine, Rick Baker, and Stephen King. Everyone has a moment where for the first time they feel that creativity might be in their future. For me, I think my moment was seeing Who Framed Roger Rabbit in the movie theater and my nine-year-old brain nearly exploding. If you haven't witnessed Who Framed Roger Rabbit, then please do so. Uh, it is a combination of so many disciplines. Uh, brilliant, funny writing, exquisite hand-drawn animation, and the costumes, the sets, and the cinematography are all amazing. And there are special effects in the movie that still fool me as much as any good magic trick. This was made before CGI was the dominating tool of wonder in the movie industry. This movie was a mixture of all the things I liked about art, and it still is today. And I desperately wanted to be around people who made things like that, things that were beautiful, powerful, disturbing, and exhilarating. I wanted to be around other hard-working weirdos. And I had no idea how to make that happen. I didn't know that I was already on my way. Like a lot of you here, my hobbies were confined to my bedroom or the backyard. I sought out solitude where there were no distractions. I practiced magic tricks. I drew monsters. I wrote scary stories. I was shooting terrible short films on my grandmother's video camera. I wasn't good at any of these things, but it didn't matter. I realize now that I was using my summers away from middle school and high school to train for my future job. And I had no idea there were classes to learn how to do all of those things better. In high school, I was lucky to be placed in a drama class. I was shocked that in this classroom, if I got up in front of the other students and recited a monologue convincingly or did a magic trick or brought in some lousy short film my friends and I made, I was given an A. This was my first inkling that I could have a career in the arts. I started auditioning for and acting in every community theater play that would have me at Kaleidoscope Theater, uh, the Martin Theater, and here at Gulf Coast State College on this very stage. I love performing in theater and making short films, but more than anything, I love practicing and performing magic. What made doing theater easy is that there were so many people around who were up for doing it with me. There were entire buildings designed just to put on plays. And when I wanted to learn uh, about drawing and painting, there were classes available at every school I went to. Highland Park, Patterson, Rosenwald, Mosley, Bay High School here at Gulf Coast. They all had art programs. If I wanted to make a short film, I could set up the camera and make it alone, or I could force my little brother and sister to be in it. <laughs> but there were no magic classes, and I didn't know any other magicians. For a few short years there, uh, there was one magic shop in town, inventively called the Magic Shop, over, over on Highway 231. It closed when I was 14, and this was in the 1990s before the internet was in every home, so I didn't know what to do to learn magic tricks other than to study the few books I had bought from the magic shop before it was gone forever. I have teenage students now who have learned everything online and have connections with magicians all over the world, and I envy them so much. I wish I'd had that back then. Would you guys like to see one of the first magic tricks I ever practiced? Yes. Yeah. I'll ask that again. You want to see a magic trick or what? Yes. All right, that's what I thought. Can I get the house lights up, please? So 
folks, magic is always a little bit better when you're not far, far away from it. The best magic happens a little closer. I gotta ask you in the back, you see the top of this table? Yeah, in the back? Now in the back, if you can't, don't be afraid to stand, just don't block anyone else. But I want you to make sure you can see the top of this table. It's pretty important for this to be an actual magic trick, all right? Can you see it? Don't be afraid to stand up if you need to. Just don't block anybody. Make sure you look behind you. Okay. I want to show this to you. I never, I never really get a good chance to show this to anybody because this is kind of a trick that's hard to do in, in a lot of environments. Um, you have to have all, all of you watching. You gotta have a table. You guys can see this. You recognize this trick? Three upside down cops yeah. and a guy who cheats. Yeah. This is apparently the oldest trick in magic. This goes back five thousand years into the past. Then it comes with these three cups and a magic wand. And that will magically keep you single if you have that on your shelf. Don't show this kind of stuff off. It's not very cool, okay? Now the cups will be the solid brass. Solid brass, right? Uh, there's no moving cards, no doors, anything like that. And one cup will be smaller if it goes straight through, something like that, you know? It goes straight through. Also, the wand, it goes into a hole like this. It's better, see? Okay. Uh, I, the most important part of this is it comes with this little thing. I have, uh, you've probably seen this before, it's like an old, old idea. Um, again, this is the oldest trick in my life, but it involves a little ball or some kind of like pebble or rock you have to follow, right? For this to be magic not gambling, you need one more. I'll do that again, thank you. <laughs> now look, you take the wand like this and spin it, but it appears by itself over there. That's, that's fine. I got you, it's all here. All right, it's all. <laughs> Everyone else only put it there. Right? <laughs> so look, I'm going to roll my suit up just a bit. I'm going to do this trick very slowly. If you see how it's done, I don't care. I'm going to do the trick later and show you how you can do this at home. Okay, so watch closely. You take the first ball like this, you put it in the hand, you wave the magic wand, it goes away. Thank you. I'll do it again. <laughs> Rousing response from you. Thank you. <laughs> it gets harder to do this each time because now people know what's coming. They know what you're about to do, so you have to do it a different way each time you do it. So if you put it in the hand this time, you can't just banish it like that. It, <coughs> excuse me, it makes it go away. It's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Look at it. What are you laughing at? 
Well, here's the thing. <laughs> to make it easier to follow, those are really under the cuffs, right? To make it easier to follow, I'll get rid of this one, all right? And that narrows it down just a bit. I'll put it in my back pocket. I'll get rid of this one, too. And that leaves Gabby, how many right here? Very good. One. That's not as nice. Now, this one comes back, and that's confusing. Right? The way that it works is this. I'm not really taking it out of my hand. I'm just pretending to take it. Do you see that, Gabby? That's basic sleight of hand. The first thing you learn is just kind of practicing take it. It stays here. Right? You just pretend to take it. It stays here. Right? And the first thing you do this in the mirror, you just do this in the mirror over and over. You actually take it over and over and over. And what does that look like? And then you don't take it, and it looks the same. Right? Okay. I, I illustrate this just to kind of show you I'm not really putting it away. It stays in my hand. It's not my back pocket. When I look at this cup, I slip it under there like it was there, right? Does that make sense? It's kind of a little confusing. Okay. I'll put it away for real. How many does that leave here, guys? All three. Oh, yeah, all three. And it's a lot. It's a lot. I know. It's a lot of money. Last one. Last one. I know. I know. I know. You're always done. But look, all three go away. Tap the cup where you want all three to reappear. I uh, can't be that one. Sorry. That's, that's where the limit is. That's kind of the thing. Give it up for Gabby, everybody. Nice job. Gabby, Gabby, Gabby. Get your link to you here. Thank you, Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you all. Are you really? Are you just dying to have a car next to you? Great. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching that, everybody. That was fun. Yeah. So, uh, we'll go back up here to my speech. So that's one of the first things I worked on as a kid. That was me in my bedroom, kind of practicing that. And apparently, they say that's the hardest magic trick in, in, in magic. And I have to agree, that's, that's a lot going on. There's a lot of things happening. It took a lot of time to sit and practice that. I had to, I had to focus a lot of my time on just these basic, tiny little things. And then, eventually, I had to find a way to make it entertaining. And that's maybe the hardest part, is how to communicate that to an audience so they know what's going on. So that when those limits appear, they know a trick has happened, right? So part of my job today is to offer some advice on not only finding and maintaining a career in the arts, but how to start creating your own art now while you still get to live rent-free with your family. <laughs> I had no money growing up, and the library was a free way for me to learn more about magic and painting and filmmaking. As my mentor, the brilliant sleight of hand artist Jamie Ian Swift says, quote, I have come to the conclusion that much of the world's wisdom has been cleverly concealed from us in books. And the truth is, all of magic's secrets, all of the secrets to anything you want to do well, are there, ready to be discovered, for free. If you can't afford to have books sent to you via Amazon.com or going to Books A Million, it's okay. Get someone to take you to the local library and ask the librarian to help you look up books on your favorite art form. I seriously want to dissuade you from learning everything from YouTube. There are some decent teachers on there, of course, but there are a lot of people who don't know what they're doing yet, putting out tutorials on YouTube when they really should be practicing. Do use the internet to find other people who are interested in the same thing as you are. Hopefully find people who live here in the same town as you. Get together and learn from each other. You'll be inspired by their progress and you will grow faster as an artist. One of the main reasons to seek higher education in the arts, for instance here at Gulf Coast State College, is so that you can meet other people with similar interests and grow together. If you can, and this isn't always easy, but Find a mentor and or a teacher. You might have several throughout your life, but find someone who has been doing this for longer than you have, someone whose work you admire, and seek them out for advice and guidance. If you can't afford to pay this person, offer to cut their lawn, bake them brownies, offer to help them with errands. Seek honest criticism from this person and from people whose opinions you respect. Do not ask everyone on earth what they think of your work. And whatever you do, if you end up with your work appearing online somewhere, avoid the comments section. That's actually a great rule for the rest of your life in the age of the internet. Avoid the comments section and do not engage with the comments section. Don't worry about how many likes or followers you have. Just trust your work. For right now, make what you make, whether anyone wants to buy it or not. And honestly, for a good long while, no one will want to pay you for what you do. So just do it for you. Trust your gut and trust the few people whose opinion you value. Arrive early. I know I say this even though we started late, but arrive early. I'm not kidding. 
I've gotten more jobs from simply arriving to a meeting not just on time, but early. It shows that you care. And it shows the person who might want to hire you that you are reliable. One of the most important sentences I've heard in my life is, to be early is to be on time. To be on time is to be late. And to be late is unforgivable. Well, I don't know if it's unforgivable, but it's definitely not a good look. I've gotten hired over magicians and actors who are much better than I am simply because I was early to the audition. That's one of the biggest secrets of the show business. You don't even have to be good at what you do if you are punctual. But please, do try to be good at the work you do. <laughs> Spend your time right now getting better and better at the art you create. I make my living today out of skills I learned when I was in middle school and high school, and I hope to have those skills the rest of my life. Practice your work now while you have the time, because I promise you it gets harder to practice anything as you get older and busier. I'm currently learning guitar, and I wish I had started when I was 12, when I had my evenings, weekends, and summers free. Because right now, at 38 years old, I don't have the time to give it the practice that it demands. I don't want to sound like your parents and grandparents, but put down the video game controller and practice something personal. Practice something that is yours. The video games you love are someone else's art that you are enjoying. But give your own art plenty of that precious time, too. And do it now. It's later than you think. Before you can make a career out of what you do, begin to treat this like it is your career. You can do that today. Do your schoolwork, obviously. Go to your job after school if you have one. But begin to see your art as part of what you do. Show up to it. And don't let anyone shame you for caring about it. People will try. There are people who will tell you that the art you love isn't worth your time. But that isn't up to them to decide that. If I had listened to the people that told me that magic and theater were not worthwhile things to pursue, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. And I wouldn't have traveled the world doing what I love. You are what you love. So lean in and learn more about your chosen field and make it happen for it yourself. If you can't find a local community of artists to join, create that community. If you don't see a project you would like to be a part of, create that project. There's no one stopping you. And I promise it's worth it. Your life will be richer if you continue to be creative. Stephen King put it best, life isn't a support system for your art. It's the other way around. I encourage you to learn any skill set that is offered to you. I did not want to be a mechanic or a welder or a plumber, but I'm so glad I know how to do a few of those things. Working on new tricks, and especially working on heavy duty, highly technical special effects for the theater and film I have needed, all those skills. I, I, I seriously recommend taking classes that live outside your chosen art form. You will end up using what you learn, I promise you. And if you plan on being self-employed, I highly recommend you take at least one class in business. I truly wish I had. Uh, I say all this, but I have studied and taken classes in Photoshop, a skill I desperately need, and I still have no idea what I'm doing when I open that program. <laughs> so, treat your art like a job now. Be forever a student of the art form you love. There's always something more to learn. And do like you did today. Show up and lean into it. You showed it today, and I ask you to keep doing that. Keep showing up and always, always arrive early. Thank you. Uh, later on, later on we're going to do a little Q&A where you can ask me questions and I'll answer them as honestly as possible, but I thought to show you a few more magic tricks, how's that sound? Yeah. All right, all right. Wait, let me get, one. get your camera out. Okay. <laughs> he did mention we're filming this as well, right? <laughs> It'll be on YouTube and everything. It'll be a much better uh, filming than what you're going to do with that camera. <laughs> By the way, I wish so much that uh, we I, I had cell phone video cameras when I was growing up. Oh my goodness, that'd have been amazing. Those movies I was making, I would have made them all the time. I would have been able to edit them really fast. I shot them on my grandma's camera, and it's just, uh, they're horrible, I can't even watch them now. Um, does anyone here play cards? Anyone gamble? Anyone? No? You shouldn't be gambling at this age, all right? <laughs> that said, that said, who has some cash? I'm kidding, I don't want your money. Uh, uh, look, uh, a, word, a word of advice, a word of advice. If you see someone do fancy things like this with a deck of playing cards, you probably shouldn't play them for money because uh, they might mean that they have other cards on them in their sleeve. They might have a whole other deck up there, you never know, you know, that kind of thing. So don't, don't play with someone who does that. Um, can I get the house lights up just a bit again? I don't want to see these faces. In the hat, what's your name? Uh, Jared. Hey Jared, how you doing? Do we know each other? Uh, good, 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 all right. I want to make sure I don't, I'm not asking people that we've not set up anything, right? Jared, I want you to uh, think of a card 
any card you want. Don't change your mind once you have it. You have it? Yeah. Okay, Jerry. For the first time, out loud so everyone can hear it, really project that voice. Don't say ace of spades, by the way. Every, everyone says that. It's too obvious. Don't be basic, all right? Any card you want, name it out loud. Go for it. Jack of cards. Are you sure? Do you want to change your mind? No. Um, that's a little bit of a problem. Um, I, I, don't, I don't really keep the jack of hearts in the deck. You can understand that? Yeah. Well, it, no, the truth is, I mean, I, I, I show you where I keep it. Um, I'll try to be really appropriate about this, but, um, well, it's just my pocket here. Jack of hearts. So <gasps> that could have been a coincidence. Who knows, you know? Want to see how that works? Yeah. All right. Come up here. Get, get, get up here. Come here. Give him a round of applause. Here. Clap on him. Come on up here. Scurry up here, that's good. Come over to this side if you don't mind. How you doing? I'm, I'm Matt. Good. good to meet you. Uh, so I want you to do this. Uh, you said Jack of Hearts. Do you want to use that one or do you want to take out one that has a lot of room to write on it? You're going to write your name. Okay. So one like this, one like that. Any one you want. It doesn't matter if I see it, but take it on out. I'm going to hand you a marker and you are going to mark this card so that it's unique. So there's no other card like it on Earth. I'll take the rest of the deck. Write your name nice and big on that card on, on the face side. Yeah. And once you're done, let me know. I'll take the marker back from you. And just show that everybody that don't see it. Two of clubs, is that right? Yeah. All right, and there's a name. Now look, I don't have another two of clubs. Even if I did, there's only one with your name on it. Jared? Yeah, Jared, look at that. Jared, one last thing. I know this is a bit awkward, but would you examine this pocket? You can just reach it. You don't dig in there if you don't want to. I'd rather you didn't, actually. But just, <laughs> just yeah, like, please, we're on camera here. To make sure that doesn't, yeah. Make sure that's nice and empty. Good. That was a pretty good tug you just gave us. <laughs> Make sure there's nothing else in there. All right. Watch this. The card here, watch this. It goes in the middle. It's right there in the middle, right? You've heard of magicians using their sleeves. Have anyone heard this? Yeah. Watch this. The card goes in the middle. I hold on to where it is. I don't lose it. Right? It's kind of the first obvious thing in magic. You don't lose the card. You hold on to it. And you cut it so it kind of flies up your sleeve. Goes across your chest ah, like that. Goes down the side of your body. It goes into that empty pocket. It was empty, right? Yes. My hands empty too, but look at this. Nah. Jared, come here, come here. Come here, come here. I'll show you. Look, it's right here. There's Jared's card. Right? <laughs> no, look. You walked away. That was, you didn't know it was coming, so I'll do this again. Now that you know it's coming, watch. This card goes in the middle. That is in the middle, right? Yeah. Yeah? And look, I don't really push it in flush. It kind of goes at an angle. Do you see that? My little finger hits it sort of against the side of my hand, it goes kind of past my watch, it goes up towards my left bicep here. You bring that over to your left pectoral muscle, you sort of flex that over to the, what are you laughing at? It goes down the side of your body, and you gotta, you gotta, a lot of core work you gotta do to get this to happen, but if you use your hand, it's not as impressive, right? Right? So it's more magical if it doesn't, you know, like, I don't see you putting it in there. Take, we'll take the two of clubs, watch the two of clubs here. You can see it there, right? Two of clubs, watch this. Ah, okay, it went a little faster that time. It goes across. It tickles when it goes across. Sorry, it goes down. Check it out. Look. What? I know, right? <laughs> Even though no one asked, I'll do it a third time. <laughs> Thank you for asking. I watch this. Oh, they're only asking. Isn't that cool? Okay, watch. It goes in the middle. Last time. Last time. You get to see this one more time before uh, I go away. Watch, it goes here, in the middle. Guys, if you stare at me any harder, I might catch fire. Watch, watch, watch. I might have got the wrong one. Okay, it's okay, okay. It goes up, across. I tell you what, do you mind? Would you reach in there and get it? I won't touch it. You reach in there and get it out. This is a... I know, it's a little awkward reading. <laughs> is it normal? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> That's not, that's the wrong card. That's, I knew it's wrong. That's not it. Hold on. <laughs> what? That's not it. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> what the heck? Oh, you know what happened? Every card went but one card. Wait, what? Wait, what? Wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> there you are. <laughs> wow. Thanks, man. Okay. Hey, no, 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 you're not done. Okay. So look, that's that's kind of cool and all. But look, uh, if I put this card back in the middle, right? And that's right there in the middle. Right? So, uh, oh, what's it? Oh, yeah, right there. So we'll put it here, right? Right in the middle, right there, right? Yes. Now look, it's not going to go up my sleeve this time. It's actually going to be end up wherever you want it to be. And uh, put it this way, it'll stay in the deck of cards, but it'll be between 1 and 52. Ah. So right, hold out your uh, left hand to me like this. That's your other left hand. Good, yeah, good. Uh, <laughs> hold your other hand above it like that for me. And hold it like this, like that, yeah. Like that, hold it tight like that. And what I want you to do is actually, I'll at least inside my wallet here. I have a wallet for you. Give me a number between 1 and 10. Uh, 6. 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, Five, <laughs> six. So two of clubs with Jerry's name on it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> okay. Is there another one in there? Let me make sure. <laughs> no. All right. Jared, everybody, thank you so much, buddy. Thanks so much. <laughs> that was fun. All right, so uh, let's 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 ask some. If anybody want to do some questions? Uh, see if anybody wants to ask me anything. We got a microphone coming around. Yeah, I got a mic here. So if you have a question, raise your hand so we can get your camera on your question on the camera as well. So if you have a question, raise your hand. Yeah. I'm Deborah. Head. Uh, hi, Deborah. Head. <laughs> yeah, we do. Hi. This is hi. my this is my drama teacher. It's my drama teacher in high school, right here, Deborah Head. Hi. Oh. <laughs> and I told my friends why I said, I don't know. And I'm so excited to reconnect. Oh, good to see you. Oh, my goodness. Good wow. You. That's the kind of person that uh, you know you can learn from at this age. That's kind of set me on this path. Wow. Good to see you. <laughs> I'm Christina Howell. Hi, Christina. Uh, <laughs> I'm. Now interested in the magic the tricks and stuff. Yeah. I was wondering how I would get uh, gain the knowledge, basically. Gain, gain the knowledge. How to, how to learn magic? Um, I tell everybody, I think that um, really the best way to learn magic, honestly, is via books. Um, and there's a lot, of, the library has a bit, for me at least, when I was here, the Bay County Library had a lot of magic books at that time. Um, we live in an amazing time where there's a lot of uh, free literature online, but um, I, I'd recommend not learning via videos. Like YouTube is a great way to kind of see how things should look, maybe. But often people are in their bedrooms, kind of showing a magic trick badly, <laughs> and they don't really know what they're doing exactly. So I, I really highly recommend. Uh, there's a there's a huge amount of magic books that are available. Um, that's the best way. Uh, we live in a time now where how old are you, Kristen? Seventeen. Seventeen. See, when I was this age. Uh, I think I got on, I first got online, like got emailed here at Gulf Coast when I was 19. So I was, did my first Google search or Yahoo search around that time. So like, you have to imagine, like I, I had, there was a lot of resources I didn't know how to learn magic. So I was really learning from the few books I had. But um, do you do anything now? Or are there any magic books you know? Uh, not really. Not really. <laughs> it's a school. Yeah. But I'd say to get, get a book. I mean, there's, there's a, my first book that I had was called The Amateur Magician's Handbook. And it was this really thick book with almost no pictures. Incredibly hard to learn from it. But I did. I learned a lot. I still, I still have it. I still learn. I, my library has grown quite a bit. But um, no, I would honestly go to the library to see what books are there. I, I would look up beginner's magic books. There's a lot of amazing books. Uh, there's a series of books called The Tarbell Course in Magic. Um, there's a... There's books that specialize just in cards, books that specialize just in like mind reading, things like that, you know, but I would just look it up, you know. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have a question? Yeah, I'll come back to you. What do you do for your spare time, like, besides when you're not doing the job? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't have a lot of spare time. <laughs> Being self-employed means that you don't really, you know, you'd think you'd have more time to kind of like uh, do what you want. I can turn down work and have time off, but I, I really just kind of take whatever gig comes my way or, or whatever pay me the, the rate that I want. But um, my spare time, I like to go to shows, I like to go see theater, I like to, I like to go to movies. Um, 
I'm, like I said, I'm learning guitar, and that's really fun to actually work on something that I'm not planning to make a living from that. It's just for recreation and try to be better at it. Um, yeah, I, like to draw, I still like to draw and paint, but I'd say a lot of my time is, is practicing new things or keeping old magic tricks fresh, like the cups and ball, I had to keep that fresh. Um, writing new material, uh, write like, uh, and then doing business, basic like the boring business stuff, you know, like taxes and and uh, you know, writing a contract so I can get hired, things like that. So that's a free time. I'm starting to cook a lot more. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Paul. Uh, hey, Paul. You said earlier that you did special effects, is yes. that correct? Yes. Um, what, what is probably the most difficult uh, effect that you've ever done? Wow, that's a good question. Um, the most difficult special effect. Uh, they're always hard, especially if um, you're training an actor to do something. Like on, on stage, a special effect has to happen every night at the same exact moment um, in front of different audiences. And you know, people are different every night. How you feel about what you're doing is different every night. And so your timing might be a little off, but a magic trick doesn't care. It has to happen exactly the right way. And a magic trick is unforgiving. A special effect is unforgiving. If you see how it works, the audience is done. They don't care anymore, right? So it's either a really good trick that fools you, or it's just a thing that kind of didn't fool you at all. There's no in between. There's no middle ground. Um, the hardest trick I ever worked on, man, so, okay, I'm, you're not supposed to say this word in a theater, but I don't care. <laughs> I worked on a really great production of Macbeth, uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth, and it was uh, this incredible play that Teller of Penn and Teller, the one who doesn't talk, he directed this, and I worked on the special effects for it. And the whole idea was in Macbeth, there are all these hallucinations. There's things that the characters are seeing that maybe aren't even happening. They're just kind of seeing, like, a bloody dagger floating around the room, and they're seeing uh, witches appear and disappear. And Shakespeare wrote all this into the play. It's all in the script from the 1500s, you know. Um, and he has, uh, uh, my gosh, Lady, Mac Lady Macbeth sees blood on her hands that aren't really, it's not really there. And the whole idea of the play was that we were going to do this version where the audience sees the hallucinations as well. Because usually you just mime it. You, just, you see a dagger that no one else sees. We wanted the audience to see what they were seeing. Because a magic trick makes you feel like you're going crazy. That's what a good magic trick should do. And that's what everyone that's in Macbeth is feeling, is like, am I seeing this thing? So we had to make Lady Macbeth see blood on her hands and have it come from somewhere. And she was in a, just a nightgown, like a really sheer kind of like long nightgown, no sleeves. And this actress had to have blood appear, and she's losing her mind, and she ended up covered in it. So we had to figure out how do we deliver that fake blood to her, it was very hard to do. Liquid, is, liquid does not like to be held captive. So there was a lot of like tubing and spun little bulbs full of blood and things like that. It was, it was crazy sprayers in the, in the set, it was nuts. And in that same, that same show, we had a cauldron for the weird sisters to be around and all these apparitions come out of it. Like there's a, a, a baby that floats out of it and a severed head floats out of it and talks. And to do that, we had a cauldron on a stand and then there's like a big gate here that opened up that people walked through the, throughout the whole show. And at one moment in, that, in the play, we had some mirrors come in that hid a giant contraption that came in. And this still, this still looked empty here. It still looked like there's nothing here. But a giant contraption came in that would raise things out of the cauldron. And the audience was looking right at it and didn't know that they were looking at, at mirrors. That was so expensive and so hard to do. Oh, my goodness. There was another show. I did. A, I worked in a lot of gory things. I, I did a lot of like special effects, like horror things like that. So there was a lot of like, cutting and stabbing and stuff. Um, we did one. I did a play called Play Dead, where every night a different audience member. We're not kidding. A different audience member would come up on stage, and the guy doing the show would like do a surgery on the guy and like cut him open and pull stuff out. And the guy didn't know what was happening. And at one moment, this live woman crawls out of the guy's chest and falls out on the ground. It's like a big ghost woman or something like that. It was one of the hardest special effects I've ever had to work on. It was really weird, and that person on stage had no idea how it was happening. It looked amazing, but that took a lot of research. It took a couple of years of thinking and building. So special effects are hard, yeah. Hello, my name is Katina. Hi, Katina. Hi, uh, I'd like to know when 
if you can remember your first professional performance where you actually realized this is it. Oh, wow. Um, there were a couple. Well, I'll tell you that I think the first time I was ever paid to perform was at the Martin Theater. I was in a production of The Rainmaker, and I, I actually got a paycheck for it. I mean, I've done all these community theater plays, but that was the one time they, that was an ensemble show, they had actually asked me to be in it, and I got this, there was a small check, I think it was around 300 bucks for an entire couple months of rehearsal. But I was so excited, they, they paid me to, to act. Like, I had fun, and they paid me. You know, it was nuts. Uh, that, that, I don't know if that was the first time that I felt that, but I, I'll tell you the first time I got paid well to do a, a magic performance. Uh, that was probably in 2004 or something like that, and that did feel pretty great. I, did, I, didn't, I didn't know anything about how to pay taxes, so that was a shock that 50% of that was not mine. <laughs> <laughs> so that came later. No one really taught me about this. I said I need to take a business class. That's what I mean. It would have helped me a lot. Like, oh yeah, put half of every paycheck away, Matt. That's not... That's not being taxed yet, yet, so, yeah. Hey there, uh, this is Tristan. Uh, where, where, where are you? Oh, there you are. Hey, Tristan. Greatest source of motivation. Greatest source of motivation. Um, well, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I'm, I'm a pretty anxious person. I have a lot of anxiety, and I've not been diagnosed as like a problem. I'm not on medication or anything like that, but I'm a very anxious person. And my brain will very quickly go to like some sort of like, okay, everything's wrong. What's wrong? And if I don't have a project to work on, if I don't have some things that need to be done, um, my brain will start to eat itself, you know? So I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone in that. Um, the, you know, the, I, my, my grandparents would always tell me like, idle hands are the devil's playground. And I never really knew what that meant. Um, I don't think it means that you're gonna do bad things. I just think it might sometimes mean you're going to be bad to yourself. Uh, I like I like making things. I like seeing things like an idea I have all of a sudden start to become a, a thing. The hardest part is starting it, but once you start it, and once you get it going, you feel this kind of like, oh, I need to, I need this is what I need to be doing. And it doesn't matter if anyone sees it. It doesn't matter if anyone likes it. I just need to make this thing, even if it's not even good yet. Just it keeps me sane. It keeps me healthy. Yeah. Um, also, too, when, when it's your only source of, uh, source of income and you like eating and you like having shelter, that's a huge motivator to get off your butt and start making stuff, you know? So. This, this, she's had a hand up for a while. Okay, I'll come to you next. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Leah. Hi, Leah. I just wanted to ask, what's the, your favorite play that you ever worked on? My favorite play I ever worked on? Uh... Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> that was, I, I did Romeo and Juliet at Kaleidoscope Theater, my first play. Was that your first play too? Uh, I Kaleidoscope, yeah. Yeah, Jason and I were, that's how we met, was doing Romeo and Juliet. I love Shakespeare. I mean, that's, once you start to get past, I don't understand what this means. Like, once you start to kind of just take it as music, and the, and the words are just, it's about the rhythm of it, and it, you'll, you'll understand it later maybe, but just let, it, let the words hit you. Um, I think working on that production of, of Macbeth was my first time. My Penn and Teller were my childhood heroes. Those are my favorite magicians, still to this day, my favorite magicians. They're the smartest, hippest. They have, they, they, they have so much to say about magic. And Teller, my childhood hero, asked me to work on this play, one of my favorite plays. He's doing a scary, uh, horrific version of it with magic and special effects and wants me to be part of it. I'll never get over that high. That was such an exciting job. It was one of the hardest things I've ever worked on, but I, oh man, that was so much fun. That was, that's my favorite. And that was back, that was over 10, that was almost 10 years ago. Hi, I'm Katrina, and I was wondering, where is your favorite place that you got to travel? My favorite place I got to travel? Um, uh, I've not been, I've not been like all over the place, but I have been some pretty neat places. Uh, I got to go to Thailand for a, they hired me and my business partner to go to Thailand, to an island there. Uh, called Koh Samui, and we're out there in the middle of this beautiful island, and we're doing card tricks, looking out over the water, and I, I looked at Prakash, I was like, card tricks brought us here? Look at this, what is this? And uh, that was pretty neat, I, I enjoyed that a lot. I'm going to Iceland in January, uh, actually de December 29th through January 9th, there's a cabaret that's having me perform there, and I, I, don't, I have no idea what that's like. Iceland is, 
a volcanic, glacier-ridden, amazing place that only has three hours of daylight that time of year. It's going to be freezing cold. I can't wait to see it. It sounds like an alien landscape to me. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. The arts will take you places. I'm, I mean, that's what's funny about it is that um, people, people covet um, extraordinary experiences. And if you think about how much TV, how much Netflix is on, how, much, how many movies are out there, and how, many, how much we look for things to take us out of ourselves, that's what art's for, is to kind of see the world through someone else's eyes. And people want it. I mean, everyone here has a favorite movie or a favorite song or a favorite something, you know, a favorite form of creativity. And there are people who will pay you to come do it someplace because they need you to do it because you do it well. And, and I, I keep saying, you don't even have to do it that well. Just show up to where you, this thing is done. Show up early. Say, I want to be part of this. How can I help? Can I sweep the floor here? And you end up in it. You somehow end up in the art form you want to be in if you show up to it. I'm not kidding. Just be brave enough to go, I want to be part of this. How do I do this? And you'll end up, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised every day that people want to pay me to do magic tricks. I, I can't believe it. So I'm, I'm very lucky. I, I think, but to answer your question, I, I think that's the one that rings, rings a bell is that, that that was like a tropical paradise thing that I, I never thought I'd see. Even growing up here in Florida, that was different. That was just bizarre. You know, It was really pretty, though. Who else? I'm Lexi. Where's Lexi? Right here. There you go. Hi, Lexi. Okay. Um, you said that you were a fan of Stephen King, oh, correct? Yeah. Well, uh, what's your favorite Stephen King book? My favorite Stephen King book, I think, uh, I really enjoyed Firestarter when I read it in high school. Because I, well, I'll tell you what I liked about Firestarter. Firestarter has these characters. Uh, this is this father and this husband and wife who they took part in some experiments the government was doing on telekinesis. And the experiments went too far and the guy now can do this thing where he can push you, psychically make you do something. He can make you see things that aren't happening, he can make you hear things that aren't happening, he can make you do anything he wants, but it makes his head hurt. It gives him a nosebleed when he does it. And I love the vulnerability of showing a power like that, but it takes something out of you. I like that writing. Stephen King is like, the Bruce Springsteen of horror. He, it's all about small town, very recognizable human beings, and like scary things happen. I, I think magic and horror have a lot in common, that they're both about the unnatural invading the natural. Or, you know, it, it, magic's not great with a, with a weird object. I mean, it's not even that great with weird cups like that. It's better with coffee cups to me. You know, I like, uh, I like, I like magic and scary things, because they, they make me feel alive in a weird way. You know, I think they're all about conquering nature in a weird way. That's, I can get way deeper into that and bore the living crap out of you. Sorry, but let's move on. All right, I think we got time for a couple more. Okay. Yeah. okay. Good questions, everybody. Thank you. That's good. Hi, I'm Julia. Hi, Julia. Um, so my school is doing a play right now, and I'm like in love with it. But I realize that I get into my head too much, and okay. I'm saying like, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, you could do better. So I'm guessing my question is, how do I? not do that. Well, that. That never goes away. And you got to make friends with that. And you also, have, you know, my business partner, Prakash Peru, is a brilliant magician, but he, he said something to me recently that really matters, and it's been helping me a lot, is that that's the first voice. That voice is saying, ah, you're garbage, you shouldn't be here, you don't deserve to be here, you don't know what you're doing, no one, no one likes you. A second voice has to come in that says, okay, right, but here we are, and you're good at this, and it's going to be fine, and it's not about that at all. And that voice has to be louder. The second voice has to be louder. Yeah? And if you practice that, it's like working out a muscle. It doesn't come easy. That second voice, you have to work that thing out and let it be louder and let it be like, no, you got this. Jimmy Fallon of The Tonight Show, he was in an interview, and he said this thing. He said, like, every night before he walks out on stage, he's behind that curtain, and they're about to go, Jimmy Fallon! He's back there going, oh my God, you don't deserve to do this. You know, what are you doing? You shouldn't be here. This is the host of The Tonight Show, the longest running TV show in TV history, right? And he's back there going, ah, I shouldn't be here. And he goes, Jimmy found the curtain opens and he goes like, oh, I'm fine, here we go, I'm good. Before I walked out here today, I was back there going like, just don't, don't suck, just do your job, be good. Okay, just, maybe they're gonna, they're gonna like you, are they gonna, are they gonna pay attention? Are they gonna be into this? Are they, are they gonna like it? Are they gonna be bored? And then he says my name and I walked out like, all right, here I am, I'm doing it. You know, that never goes away. You just gotta find a way to not beat yourself up about having that voice. Let the second voice be louder. 
Yeah. All right, good. Last question. Last question. Right. Hello. Hi. I'm Lainey. Hi, Lainey. Um, Your name is Lainey? Yeah. Hi, Lainey. Um, what do you do when you get like creativity block? Sort of. Creativity block. Um, that, that happens. Um, you kind of have to push through it. You have to just, let's say, what, do you, what is it that you like to do? Do you have a particular art form that you're interested in? Or do you have a creativity? What do you, what do you like to do? Drawing and video editing? Yeah. Um, I, I like to draw. I, I'm bad at video editing. I mean, I'm a very analog person when it comes to like how to handle anything on the online. I'm, uh, I'm lost. Anything with buttons, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, drawing, I think that empty page is scary, but do it. Just, just make something that's not good. Just do it. Push through it. Or take a break. Go watch something. I think one of the most important things you can do as a creative person is take in other art. Go, go to a museum, go, to, go see things, go see a movie, go, go read a book, see how someone else is dealing with that, you know? There's no real good, solid answer for that, honestly. I mean, it's different from everybody. I think push through it and keep, keep up with it. And, and know that it's not for anybody else, exactly. You know, really, you're making this because you need to. So do it for you, just draw something. Edit something, you know? Any parting words of wisdom? Parting words of wisdom. Um, I not really, guys, thank you so much for being here. It really means a lot to me that you guys came out. I, I remember being out here, I mean, I, I sought out things like this, and, I, and it really means a lot to be on this side of the stage this time and talking to you. So thank you so much, and keep making work. Keep doing it, guys. Thank you. All right, guys, so here's what's going to happen next. We're going to take a, take a short break. And then what we're going to do is we're going to split into four different workshops. So you have a choice of either art, music, theater, or dance. Now you may be saying, well, that's not really what I'm into. I'm into like video editing. So like Matt suggested in his talk, go to the one that is maybe uh, indirectly related to what you're interested in. For example, uh, we'll be hold holding the theater workshop over there. If you're interested in directing or playwriting or acting for the film, or, or um, producing, anything that's sort of in the world of theater and film, that would be appropriate. If you're interested in dance or choreography um, or costuming even, you could stay here for dance. If you're interested for visual art, if it's drawing, painting, photography, ceramics, um, uh, Professor Am Roman, who's teaching that section, he's a, he's, a, he's a potter and he works with ceramics, but he's also a graphic designer. So a lot of these things you know, feed into each other. The thing I encourage you when you get into the workshop setting is don't be afraid to ask questions. Yeah, this is a great opportunity for you to pick the brains of folks that have made a career out of the thing that was their passion and, and still is in many ways. So don't be afraid to, to sort of do that. So, so here's what's going to happen. If you're interested in dance, that workshop's going to be in this room. So you'll stay here. If you're interested in theater, we're going to go up those stairs straight across, OK? If you're interested in music, you're going to go back to the area where you had the donuts this morning. And if you're interested in visual art, you're going to go over here to the left, all right? Um, let's see. Colleagues, is there anything else I need to tell them as, as a large group before we split? There are students and folks that are out there directing traffic for you. If you're looking at the schedule, you're probably thinking, OK, well, we're off schedule now. We're just gonna we're gonna stay on schedule. We're just gonna eat into the workshop time. Okay? So because I know some of you are on buses and things like that. So let's say let's all meet at our workshop spots like in five minutes. Um, and then I'll still give us a, a full hour uh, for your workshop. Any questions anybody has that I can answer from the microphone? All right, so let's take five minutes, go to the bathroom, maybe grab another donut, and then you'll meet at your workshop area. Thank you, guys. <laughs>